warm introduction and welcome to everybody. Nice of you to come. But you, I knew you'd come because we're off to the pantomime. <laughs> and this is not any old pantomime. This is the first English pantomime, Harlequin and Mother Goose or the Golden Egg, written in a hurry by Thomas Dibden and first performed in 1806. And through the magic of these board games, off we go. And there is Mother Goose and the Golden Egg, published in London just a little later, 1808. And you probably are familiar enough with games to know that this is going to be a simple race game, where we're racing along from the outside of the spiral to try and get uh, to the centre, which is uh, the winning space. And the rules are underneath, and of course, these days we should play it with dice. But, look at the rule. Whoever spins a golden egg takes a counter from the pool, that's the winner's pool. If you spin a blank, you put one in, the blank for those pink things in this copy. Why are we talking about spinning? This is the substitute for dice. It's called a teetotum, or a totem, it's a little spinning top and as you can see it's numbered on each face. It's not very well numbered, as you can see it looks a bit amateurish and that's because the numbering was amateurish. The teetotum was supplied blank and the reason for that was it avoided the, the dice duty. The Georgian dice duty was absolutely punitive. <laughs> Ten shillings per die. Now the whole game with everything could be bought for seven and six so um, you need two dice, so that would have been three times the value of the game. So that's why we have a, a teetotum, and that's why we spin. <coughs> spin and move, no choice of move, no brain required. These are uh, mindless games, not like uh, chess or bridge, which are far too difficult for me. <coughs> We're heading for the centre space. That's the winning space, showing Mother Goose. This is the first time that uh, Mother Goose uh, flew across the stage on a wire. And the reason for this is that it's the first time that fairy story elements were brought into the pantomime. Before that, the pantomime had really been based uh, upon the Commedia Arte uh, Harlequin figure. So Harlequin aids were very much what the audience would expect. But uh, Dibden uh, decided that he would uh, liven things up and start off with something of a fairy story. Now, it's not much of a fairy story, I have to say, and I'll tell you why. The, the story begins with Colin and Colinette, and they, they are lovers, uh, and uh, they wish to, to marry. But the wicked squire, boo, please, um, <laughs> uh, intervenes, and he also has the, the, the intention of ducking Mother Goose as a witch. And she decides to deal with all this by producing a, a magical uh, a golden egg, and woof, turns everybody into their Commedia Arte equivalents, so it turns into a Harlequin egg. So he doesn't have too much to write in the first two months. It's very clever. So what happens then is that the story really degenerates, I have to say, into a, a wild chase around London. So we're going to see some sights uh, enlivened by the uh, pantomime figures who are participating in them. Now, if we haven't really come to see Mr. Samuel Simmons in Entrevesti or not, we've come to see the great Joseph Grimaldi, arguably the greatest clown ever, who ever lived. And the pantomime is very much a vehicle for uh, Grimaldi's uh, bits of business. Uh, in this particular one, he's trying to drink out of a bottle, and the bottle suddenly changes, and he always gets the wrong end. And then the instructions are, he's disappointed, so you must be disappointed, and go back to space number 14 from uh, 23. The point I'd like to make is his costume, which is pretty remarkable, is described elsewhere. I've taken this from his, his biography. 
And you can see the description that's written is pretty much closely followed in, in the game. The, uh, the ribbons, the, the blue wig, and then these red triangles on either cheek. And as I was saying, games are useful pictorial witnesses, iconographically, uh, quite accurate of uh, what the Georgian past uh, was like. Now, let's get to some of the action. Here, the clown and harlequin are being pursued, and they put themselves up as figures at St. Dunstan's Church, uh, striking the bell. And so, if you remember St. Dunstan's Church, it's, uh, it, it's been, it, the clock has disappeared and come back, and that's where it is. And so you can see how nicely the game is actually showing uh, St. Dunstan. At an inn, Harlequin causes the tables to rise in the air, and before they can get down, you can move on to space 18. Now, this, of course, is very much part of the, the, the Georgian theatre, uh, bits of mechanical artifice uh, and uh, engineering, engineering wonders uh, all supporting the action. But I think probably the best of these jokes arises at Vauxhall Gardens. Now, Vauxhall Gardens, the great playground on the uh, other side of the Thames, um, where everyone in society came, including uh, royalty. And Vauxhall Gardens, here the clown, Roma Grimaldi, gains admission as a pandian minstrel, playing on a fish kettle with a ladle and whisk, with his chin resting on a broom. Where's that come from? A pandian minstrel you might not immediately recognise is a minstrel playing the pan pipes. Now, we actually know that the, the, the pan pipers were very popular at Vauxhall Gardens and they are illustrated. Here they are in performance after a, 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 an etching by Edward Francis Burney, more or less contemporary with the, with the game. And you can see the five minstrels there. They are uh, playing panpipes of different sizes, hence of different pitches, and they all have another instrument, cymbals, triangle, and the, the one in the middle has this big drum, and is playing the panpipes, as you see, and it's so like the picture of, uh, of Grimaldi as, as the clown, that everyone <coughs> must have picked up the joke, and I think it's really not a good one. <coughs> We need to do some history. I mean, this is the antiquities after all. Um, and so I want to show you where these board games come from. And I, a good place to start, in England anyway, is at the beginning. And the game that comes to England is the game of the goose, which I, I, you may not have heard of, but I'll explain it. The entry is in the Stationers Hall Register, 16th of June, 1597. I'm sorry we couldn't have the, le the, uh, the lecture on the anniversary of the uh, 16th of June, but never mind. And you'll see, you may not read court ham, but underneath it's transcribed that John Wolfe entered for his copy uh, the new and most pleasant game of the goose. And he played, paid sixpence for the privilege of registering it so that he had the, the, property, the intellectual property rights. Now, John Wolfe was the printer uh, to the City of London, and we know something of history which will be important in looking at the history of this game. We don't have his game, unfortunately. The earliest surviving example of a British goose game is a, a little later, midway through the, uh, the following century, uh, printed by John Overton in London, now in the Morgan Library at New York. And you'll see the kinship with the, the game that we started with, the, the simple spiral race game. If we go zoom in, we can see straight away why it's called the game of the goose. There are innumerable geese, or not innumerable, the 13. There are, uh, each goose gives you an, 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 your points again, effectively doubling your throw. Now, this time, uh, the game was played with two dice, a 63 space track, 
it gives you a very lively game indeed. And the game was in fact highly playable, highly popular. Um, this mentioned my exhibition at the Grolier Club. Well, we had a special functions dinner and we had all the august persons of uh, uh, New York Grolier Club playing the goose game before dinner. <laughs> uh, they, it, they lasted about 55 minutes, at which point they said, where's my dinner? And off we went. So, fast and furious game, but not plain sailing to get to the center. If you land on some hazards, then you have to pay to the winner's pool and obey the instructions. At the beginning, at the, at the bottom there, you'll see number six, the bridge, which is a sort of rite of passage where you go on. Uh, but at the top left, you're brought to a standstill if you land in the well, number, number 31. Um, you have to wait there until somebody else releases you, and then they take your place. And there's a similar rule for a prison space, not on the uh, top. Of the, of the game. Just next to it is the death space 58 with a nice skeleton on it and at that point you have to start again. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the one on the right at 42 is the labyrinth, you've lost your way and you have to go back a bit. So this is the, the, the classic uh, game of the goose and where did it in turn come from? Well compare this this is the earliest dated uh, printed goose game. Um, Lucchino Gargano in Rome, 1589. And you'll see just how close it is. And if we look at the decorative iconography of the winning space, you can see uh, that uh, there is a great similarity. Uh, these two uh, rather jovial figures um, expecting a nice drink on having won the game. I mentioned John Wolfe and his history. John Wolfe actually did his journeyman printer's training in Florence. So it's a pretty fair guess that John Wolfe was responsible for bringing a game of this type uh, from uh, Italy, though uh, I'm not saying that John Overton one is an exact copy of it. The game, as I said, was popular for about two centuries in, uh, in England and it's mentioned uh, in <coughs> the Goldsmith's poem, The Deserted Village, which talks about um, a rather low-class uh, tavern, and on the walls uh, you have two things, the 12 good rules, those are the uh, King Charles's 12 good rules of, uh, of, of behavior, human behavior, and the royal game of goose, and the idea being that you could take the game off the wall and, and play it. And we see a depiction of this in a quarto by Laurie and Whittle, 1804, uh, which interestingly shows a uh, circular uh, track rather than the spiral one. And I don't know whether that's a, a game that I haven't seen, or whether it's just artist license, you have to be careful. The game was updated in, in uh, England, not by very much, but since we're talking about Georgian England, this I thought would be worth showing about the time of George III's marriage to uh, his queen, Princess Charlotte, in 1761. And you see there the portrait, King George and Queen Charlotte at the top. But in the bottom right-hand uh, quarter, lower right-hand quarter, you see the game actually being played. And it's in quite respectable, mixed company. So that does answer to some extent the question, who was playing these games? Not children, you'll notice. This is an adult game at this stage. Now, these uh, uh, updates of the goose game didn't really do much uh, in, in England. The game was mo moderately popular by the end of the uh, 18th century. But then something happened which really did alter the whole uh, course of, uh, of game production, and that was the publication of The New Game of Human Life by Wallace and Newbury in 1790. And if we look at it, it's immediately clear that it looks like a spiral race game, it looks like a, a goose game in, in general. 
But in fact, it's much closer to a goose game than just that generality. What it does is extends the track to 84, making seven twelves. And that provides you with the uh, seven ages of man. And there are the, uh, the age spaces. You start with the infant, but then at 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72, you have the age spaces, which act like the goose spaces and double your throw. The winning space, 84, uh, shows uh, the immortal man. We'll come to him in a minute. Um, 72, you'll notice, is the age of decrepitude. I'm not going to put up hands, though. <laughs> now, this, in fact, is a moral game. And that is also significant, because many of the games that came into, into uh, print in Georgian England were, in fact, moral games. This shows the prodigal at number 30. Uh, he's wasting his substance by giving uh, money to the street urchins. And he has to go back to number six, the careless boy. The careless boy is making a house of cards, and that's very much a, a Georgian a, a trope for a, a wasted life doing something foolish. But this game is not, in fact, an English invention. It's an English piracy, really, uh, because 15 years earlier, Crepy, the big print house in uh, Paris, brought out the new game of human life, Seven Ages of Man, 84 spaces, and it's pretty much the same game. Some alterations were made for the British market. For example, the winning space, which we've seen before at 84, um, <coughs> is changed, and the space before. You'll see at the left, um, there's Rousseau, easily recognisable by his fur hat. And there is Voltaire, likewise recognisable by, on his stick. We have, for our English version at 83, we have John Locke, uh, the thoughtful man. And of course, Locke's ideas on uh, education were to prove highly significant in relation to educational board games in Georgia and England. And there, at 84, we have the immortal man. Anybody know who he is? Easily recognisable by Cambridge doctoral gown, died at the age of 84. This is Sir Isaac Newton. And so Voltaire also died at 84, so it's a pretty clever substitution. Not the only substitution. Here we have the geographer, that's Captain Cook. And really rather a nasty touch, the ambitious man. This is the, 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 the uh, young George waiting to become George IV and he's got his hand on the crown but he can't actually put it on and he's labelled as the ambitious man I mean that would have put you in, in a right. <laughs> so there we are this game was I think highly popular um, for whatever reason and highly effective in causing uh, the Georgian printers to bring out similar things not necessarily based on the game of goose but looking nice Nicely engraved, nicely coloured, and interesting. So that's where the Georgian games on London themes, which I'm going to talk about next, that's where they come from. And I'm going to begin with the panorama of London. And I brought it in so you can look at it afterwards. I've also provided uh, a key to the various scenes. 1809, John Harris corner of St Paul's churchyard, bear that in mind because it's significant, and just really to show you how beautifully this is engraved. And the, the scenes are there, uh, and we'll go through in some detail. Um, on the right, the, uh, the St George's Cross with the uh, um, sword, the arms of the City of London, that's where your winning space is going to be. But just look at the quality of engraving on the uh, picture of uh, St Paul's with these ceremonial barges uh, rowing beautifully upstream. Now, <clears throat> the spaces uh, are here. I'm not going to do all of them because many of them are just, just buildings from the outside. But, uh, so the ones in red are the ones I'm interested in, which is more like the shows and sights. And I'm going to leave the tower 
uh, for a moment until the end and begin at number 13, which is the Royal Servants, because there's quite a lot of history of uh, shows and sites to be found in this game. Here we have to pay for Mr. Elliston's expenses, he was the impresario, and we're looking at the Royal Circus in Blackfriars Road, which eventually became the uh, Surrey Theatre. And you'll notice that it is, it is showing some sort of harlot grenade. I haven't identified it in detail. We move on to the lottery drawing in Guild Hall, where you receive your prize from each player. Um, and you'll see the drawing, you notice the two large wardrobes they look like. They're, they are the lottery wheels where the tickets were uh, shuffled together. They're presided over by two blue coat boys. And the idea was that the blue coat boys were uh, young, innocent, incorruptible, and therefore could be trusted to draw tickets out of the lottery. In fact, they were easily bribable. They were highly capable of substituting a winning ticket for a non-winning ticket. And so the whole thing uh, was in some disrepute. But it looks very official there, doesn't it? <coughs> now, let's go to Sadler's Wells Theatre. And we have this uh, wonderful scene of Juno being drawn across the stage, a nice watery stage, easy to do at Sadler's Wells, uh, by uh, her sea horses. And just to have a look, a comparison view, because we can't entirely trust games without comparing them with other sources of material culture. Let's have a look at the same scene uh, in Ackerman's Microcosm of London, more or less exactly contemporary with this, and we'll see uh, that it is in fact a very close sort of representation. So you begin to wonder, was the game drawn from uh, Ackerman's uh, illustrations, or was it an independent uh, operation? Well, let's compare the next. Here we have Bartholomew Fair, where we pay one for seeing the humours of Mr. Punch, and indeed you'll see the Punch and Judy on both the left and the right of the central booth, which is uh, Mark Sanders. The corresponding Ackerman looks like this, and you'll see it's not exactly the same. And in fact, if we look at the two together, we see that the central booth, top one is labelled Richardson, and the bottom one labelled Sanders. Both are, are correct at slightly different times. So we are getting a useful, a different view of uh, St. Bartholomew's Fair. If we move on, we come to Vauxhall Gardens again, paid to see the fireworks and hear the music and singing. And then to Astley's Amphitheatre, which is the first circus ring in, in London. And so we have uh, a wonderful performing Norman Holt as we go around. And then to the Royal Academy. Uh, this, of course, is in Somerset House at the moment, rather than up here. And we pay two counters to encourage the artists which is rather nice. And again, if we want to compare the Ackerman picture, uh, we get a pretty good uh, illustration of, of what it was like. This is really not a, a show or a, or a sight. The sad occasion, this is Nelson's funeral, uh, condole for the nation's loss. But the interesting thing is that as it goes through Temple Bar, you can see that the catafalque is a representation of uh, Newton's, uh, 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 the Nelson's ship, the victory. We have politics in these games. Corn exchange, you must go back to receive punishment for monopoly. The, the price of corn was a hot topic, and of course the corn laws were uh, uh, soon to be passed. So these games are not value neutral, as we shall see as we move on. Freemasons Hall, you must keep the secret. But what this is emphasizing is how the Freemasons were setting up uh, schools for the uh, children of the poor. And you can see that the children uh, being very nicely dressed and very nicely behaved in Freemasons Hall. 
This is somewhere <coughs> which uh, you need to avoid. Pay three counters as a punishment for being seen in the riotous assembly. That's the election at Covent Garden. And it was evidently a, a, a pretty unpleasant place to be. Fighting, drinking, and so on. <coughs> and this is a sight of London that you wouldn't expect in this august company. This is John Harris's shop, corner of St Paul's Churchyard, remember? You may stop one turn, receive a counter from each player, <coughs> purchase a new game or an instructive book as your fancy may direct. So John Harris was not above a bit of self-promotion on, on this game. We're heading towards the end. Uh, we're heading for um, the City of London and we pick up the Giants Gog and Magog in Guildhall and they're quite nicely uh, depicted and that's how they really are. So I'll just go back, you can see there and there they are in, in reality. So that's the game of uh, the, the panorama of London. I'm going to move on to my second uh, tour of London. This is a much less uh, elaborate and um, carefully drawn affair. The picture of St Paul's doesn't bear any sort of comparison with that wonderful scene uh, that we had at, uh, in the panorama of London. But this game has got some interesting things not seen elsewhere. For example, it has the Cosmorama in Regent Street, and this was a sort of uh, upmarket peep show. Viewing lenses were mounted uh, on each wall, and they, behind each viewing lens there was an illuminated, specially uh, commissioned oil painting of some natural scene. One uh, was uh, Europe, one, and the other wall was Africa and Asia, and this came up very brightly and well illuminated. And you will struggle to find contemporary illustrations of the, the Cosmorama. This is a nice take on the British Museum in, in its old habitat, Montague House, and I think the, the artist probably rather enjoyed uh, this depiction, which of uh, a uh, 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 wonderfully uh, smiling cartoon figure on the on the left. But it's it, it's positive. Stop three turns, and you will not soon uh, forget it. <coughs> Vauxhall Gardens. A different take on Vauxhall Gardens. We've been encouraged to pay for the music and fireworks. We've seen the pandy and minstrels. Different experience. Here we have our pocket picked. We lose all the counters that we have left. It's a bad business. And this is not an unknown depiction of Vauxhall Gardens. And I just picked one up for comparison. Uh, this is a, a Lorry and Whittle uh, quarto um, giving the words of a song. Uh, uh, sung by Mr. Dignam, one half of the world don't know how Tata lives, and you'll see at the left here the action of the, the pocket being picked, which is rather nice. I also like the waiter going at high speed with his uh, uh, bottle and, uh, and, and corkscrew. So we have different, different takes on different activities uh, in these games. Now this is my third tour of London game, a survey of London by a party of Tarragat Home Travellers by William Darton, and I draw your attention not to the rather staid uh, depictions of uh, buildings in the game, but to the explanation or rule book, because this is a survey of London or a game complete with opinions. These opinions are very strongly held, and we'll pick them up as we go around. You see there St Paul's, just to compare the, the, the treatment, beautifully, uh, beautifully engraved, very carefully made, again, high quality. We begin uh, very locally, Bullock's Museum in the Egyptian Hall, uh, over the way, uh, just opposite the Burlington Arcade, in fact. And uh, William Darton says, from the South Seas, we have these various uh, uh, exhibits, almost curious, and chiefly brought to England by the unfortunate Captain Cook, of course, remembered for uh, dying at uh, Waiwai a little before. 
So far, so good. But here's the East India House, very grand, lately extended, and it includes a museum, of which Darton says the following. Much as we may be entertained by this curious collection of objects, they could have been spared, as we might have spared the thousands of Eastern natives who suffered from our false ambition and unjust claims on their property and landed possessions. Now, that is pretty strong stuff. This, this you might describe as pretty anti-colonial. And the, the explanation of this is that the Darton family were Quakers. And this Quaker morality extends throughout the whole game, as we shall, as we shall see. But that, I think, is, 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 has not been picked up uh, by, uh, by historians uh, 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 in, in the strength that it might have been. Darton is by no means against uh, uh, exhibitions and shows. This is Somerset House, which, in fact, housed the, the Royal Academy. This is a very local sort of presentation, you appreciate. Um, and you'll notice that the Thames wasn't embanked at this time, so if you wanted to visit, you could do so by taking your boat into that central arch, which looked very inviting. And of it, uh, uh, Darton says that the trifling admission enables the admirer of arts, though humble in station, to share the national treat with the first nobleman in the kingdom. In other words, his egalitarian uh, views are being very strongly communicated. And here um, is an even stronger uh, statement coming up. This is the Mint. This is the new building, um, 1820. The uh, old Mint was in the tower, as we shall see when we go back to the tower. Um, but of the Mint, you wouldn't think necessarily that morality would come into the Mint. You'd be wrong. Um, I've shown it in, in, in extenso. I won't read it all. Uh, a sight of such riches may create wonder, but wealth has its cares, and it's not the possession of money which can procure real content. And then, then the advice to, uh, to the, the, the young people who are playing this game. Nor would I advise my young friends to treasure up the new shilling given as a New Year's gift. Every shilling is worth 12 pence, and even such a trifling sum as this might relieve as many individuals, in other words, without giving them a, a, a meal. And again, this is unusual to see charitable giving, not uh, in general, but in such a specific way, being uh, uh, taught as, as part of uh, the game. This is not now a, a tour of London game. This is uh, showing the wonders of art in the world. Uh, wonders of art meaning the, the, the uh, man-made wonders. There's a companion, wonders of nature. But I wanted to show it because there are one or two interesting uh, vignettes of London. One of the wonders of the world, John Rennie's bridge at Southwark, the longest cast iron span ever made. And we are putting this on a par with the Great Wall of China and St. Peter's Road, which is a very nice sort of <laughs> local, a local feeling to this, this game, in case you were being, uh, uh, wondered why, whether staying at home is OK. <clears throat> but this is really my, my, one of my favorites. This is uh, Omni Mayade's Musical Lady at Spring Gardens, part of uh, an exhibition of automata. Now, Mayade was responsible for the uh, the little boy, the, the, the writing automaton, uh, and you could put in uh, a, a control plate and he would then write uh, on, on, on a piece of paper with a quill pen, whatever had been programmed into that control plate. And his uh, writing automaton is uh, regarded as an important step in the programmable uh, computer. But this is slightly different. Uh, the musical lady is seated at an organized pianoforte, in other words, it's an organ, and she plays 16 airs from the pressure of the fingers on the keys, uh, feet assist, and then uh, the uh, motion of the eyes and elegant gesture produce the actual appearance of respiration. 
actually respiration after that rather bad, breathless advertisement is really what we need to do. But it's a nice, it's a nice thing, and there, there she is uh, playing happily away. <coughs> so I've done uh, five games. Uh, the uh, game on the first English pantomime, which I brought in because it gave us a, a, a bit of a, a whirlwind uh, tour of, of London. And then three games on the sites of London, and then a game on the man-made wonders of the world. And um, here they all are. I've mentioned that they're all spin the teetotum and move. We call it these days roll and move because we think of uh, a dance, but spin is also possible. Um, no skill element, uh, and yet these games were uh, popular. Um, what are they catering to? Well, I think the games on the tour of London are really catering to the new vogue for tourism that was uh, occurring as affluence increased. They're also catering for a fairly upmarket uh, audience because these are not cheap games. If you think of seven and sixpence, that's uh, what a half or two thirds of the weekly wage for a, a reasonably skilled craftsman like a, a carpenter. So these games are are not uh, going to be picked up as as pocket money. They are uh, games that are, are going to be bought uh, by reasonably well off parents uh, for uh, their children to play. And Elizabeth mentioned that there are a good number of games which I could have shown. If I showed all the games, there'd be about 100 or so, or so in, the, in the Georgian era from about 1790 when the, the uh, game of Human Life appears. Um, and uh, they cover a very wide range of subjects. I mean, I've just picked the, the, the Tour of London, but I could have picked uh, geographical games, I could have picked games on, on history. And there really was quite a vogue for uh, education through play, I think arising from the theories of, of John Locke. Um, and in the Georgian era, it was very respectable to have these games, bring them out on a Sunday, and uh, hope that some degree of, of education would occur. I think in the Victorian era, people were a bit more sceptical about the educational value of these games. And certainly, the games tended to transmute into games of amusement uh, rather than uh, games of, of, of education. But these are, um, th these are our nice games to handle, to look at. And as I say, yeah, I've got one over there for you to, have a, a, to, to, to study as you require. Now, with all this choice, we've been uh, shown various things in London. Where should we go? Well, I thought about this and I thought what uh, sites and shows are depicted on all three of our tour games, the Panorama of London, the Scenes in London, the Survey in London, they all show the monument. So should we go to the monument? Well, let's ask William Darton what he thinks of the monument. Uh, finest pillar in the world. Sir Christopher Wren, yes, but the obscure and unpleasant spot which it honours is ill calculated to display this admirable proof of his skill surrounded by irregular and dirty streets. Now, is, is, is just imagine the, uh, the city fathers writhing a little bit at this, uh, at this point. No, that's not the place to go. The place to go, as I've hinted, is the tower. Now, here, Darton becomes much more enthusiastic. The, ta the tower includes the, the crown, the, the horse armory, the wild beasts, and the lions, and we'll see. But I just picked out what he said about the crown of state. Expe extremely splendid, a pearl pledged to the Dutch by Charles I for £18,000. And one Colonel Blood attempted to carry this off. And a very few years since, a female maniac made a, a similar uh, attempt. So uh, there you are. I mean, that's bound to be worth having a go at, isn't it? So let's have a look at these, uh, uh, at the attractions of, of the tower. Um, and they occur on the uh, panorama of London. You can see the tower at the bottom, 
uh, and I'll, I'll show the, the, the individual uh, scenes. Um, <coughs> here we have the, the horse army, <coughs> and uh, uh, we can move on then to the mint in the tower. And this is a useful in, in illustration in itself because it shows uh, the, the method of uh, coining using a, a screw press. Uh, pretty hard work, four men uh, with uh, long levers and the poor man who's at the bottom whose job it is to put the blank in underneath the, the press and to remove the newly minted coin, uh, hoping that his fingers uh, remain at the end of the, uh, of the exercise. And then we have the lions, uh, other wild animals in the tower, but the lions were uh, by far the uh, the, the most uh, sought after attraction and uh, <clears throat> finally and I think it's a good place to, to end uh, uh, in Georgian England uh, the King's Crown now I, I hope I've interested you in these games um, if I have then a piece of advertisement I take my cue from John Harris here's an advertisement for the website which um, I have. It's an Italian website, but it's, it's pretty bilingual. It's English and Italian. And on that website, um, we have over two and a half thousand of these uh, board games, um, almost all related to uh, the game of the goose. Um, they have uh, high quality or medium quality um, images, high quality for reproduction, and then you need to ask us. Uh, but we are very generous in. Uh, allowing free downloads of these and uh, uh, downloads also of uh, many uh, related articles and a very full bibliography. I've been spending most of my time since retirement um, helping to encourage the uh, study of these games and if the result of this lecture is that a bit more study goes on then I shall be very pleased. Thank you.